I'm sure you're driven up I-65 to Chicago, um, you know, through through Indiana, through Illinois, and one of the incredible sights there is a wind farm. But it is hundreds and hundreds of these huge, graceful towers that are dancing slowly in the wind. They're really beautiful, and they're an indicator of the growth of um, renewable energy um, and of, of wind energy, particularly in the United States over the last decade. And you know, uh, right now. Um, Renewable energy has grown, since 1980, it's grown 116% in the United States to where now renewable energy represents about 21% of our, our, our total energy production in the United States. And, and this is tremendous from the standpoint that it, you know, it's reducing greenhouse gases, it's reducing our dependence on, on fossil fuels, um, et cetera. When I look at a, uh, a wind generator up close, of course, I'm awestruck by the size. The, the blades can be 100 meters. Or more, they're absolutely huge. Um, that's one thing that strikes me. The other thing that strikes me is that they're basically really similar to aircraft, to modern aircraft, right? They're basically aerodynamic structures. They have to have very high strength to weight ratios, just like aircraft do. And they're made using very similar materials to what the most advanced aircraft are made out of, which are um, fiber reinforced composite materials. And so we see thousands of huge um, wind generators built similar to composite aircraft and yet we see very few if any composite aircraft out there uh, and there's a good reason for that these events are too highly publicized but wind generators fail they come apart and you can see a couple pictures here of some pretty catastrophic failures where the blades have literally just crumpled and, and fallen apart and why does that happen? Well, the, the fact that it does happen and the fact that these, that these structures are built very similarly to aircraft is part of why the FAA is not so interested in um, giving blanket approval to composite aircraft yet. Why is this? It's because if we're going to use composite materials in, in large structures, we can't do that without adhesively bonding them. There's no way to get stress transfer from one composite component to another in an efficient way without using adhesive bonds, which rather than um, concentrating the stress at the point of a mechanical fastener will spread the stress out over, over a large area, um, allowing us to, to take advantage of the inherent uh, strength to weight ratio of, of composite materials. So when you build a large composite structure, whether it's a, whether it's a, a wind generator or whether it's an aircraft, how do we do that? Well, the, the um, fiber reinforced um, polymer, the fiber reinforced resin that forms the basic structure is laid up in multiple layers. Um, it's cured to form part of the structure. And then when multiple parts of these structures are made, they have to be brought together and bonded, right? Okay, n n notice this picture that shows a cross section of a wind turbine blade. It's the, uh, the picture with the red skin. And you can see the stringers inside of it. There are two stringers. These are adhesively bonded in, the wing skins are bonded to the stringers. The leading edge and the trailing edge of this structure are also adhesively bonded. All of these bond surfaces are prepared manually. And when we look at these pictures of wind turbine blade manufacture, we see a whole lot of manual operations and we don't see a whole lot of measurement going on, right? We don't see a whole lot of, a whole lot of care being taken to ensure that the chemical composition of that bond surface has been established to the level it needs to be to get reliable adhesive bond. Well, several analyses of the causes of failure in um, wind turbines points to failure of adhesive bonding. And again, this isn't really highly publicized. When one digs into the literature, we find that one of the main problems is that the bonds come apart, right? This is because using current manufacturing methodologies, bond process control generally consists of following a series of prescribed steps for preparing, cleaning, applying adhesive, bringing the structure together, right? Without involving measurement technology to make sure that the, the chemical composition of the bond surface that is required for reliable adhesive bonding has been established. And again, until we get quantitative bond process control into these manufacturing operations, we can expect to continue to see failures like this occurring.